It started with a college course assignment, then escalated into a dangerous obsession. 18-year-old honor student Jason Moss wrote to men whose body counts had made criminal history. Men named Dahmer, Manson, Ramirez, and Gacy. Posing as their ideal victim, Jason seduced them with his words. One by one, they wrote him back, showering him with their madness and violent fantasies. Then the game spun out of control. John Wayne Gacy revealed all to Jason and invited his pen pal to visit him in prison. It was an offer Jason couldn't turn down, even if it made him the last victim. The book that has riveted the attention of the national media, this may be the most revealing look at serial killers ever recorded and the most illuminating study of the dark places of the human mind ever attempted. This audio recording is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. It was autumn in the desert, but not like the kind of autumn you'd ordinarily envision for that time of year. It was still hot, blazing hot. The only refuge from the sun was inside the refrigerated buildings. With its stately palm trees and expanses of grass, the campus resembled one of the many resorts in the Las Vegas Strip. The difference was that, instead of neon and slot machines, there was a hotel college that taught would-be entrepreneurs how to operate casinos, as well as the usual academic buildings that catered mostly to local students and a few Southern California refugees. The most prominent structure by far was the Thomas and Mack Building, the basketball arena that played host to the running Rebels. This was a university, after all, known primarily for its basketball program. The best and the brightest of the students, a few hundred ambitious, sometimes compulsive scholars, enrolled in the honors program to get the best shot they could for entrance into medical school, law school, or the corporate fast track. The requirements included several exploratory seminars designed to expand students' education beyond their narrow areas of specialty. I had volunteered to teach one of these honors seminars, called Things That Matter. I'd build it as an opportunity for advanced students to explore a series of topics, including relationships, love, friendship, and most vitally, the future. On the first day of class, I encountered an ambitious group of young people, future lawyers, doctors, politicians, CEOs, and scientists. One student caught my attention immediately because of the way he was dressed. While his peers, aged 20 to 25, wore the uniforms of their generation, jeans, t-shirts, sandals, shorts, even a skateboard or two, this particular student looked as if he'd lost his way en route to a job interview. Beyond his crisp white shirt, striped tie, and polished loafers, I noted a resemblance to one of the Baldwin brothers, William maybe or Alec. He displayed the chiseled good looks that immediately attract the attention of the opposite sex. His eyes were serious, intent, and I noticed he was watching me carefully. As the semester progressed, this young man stood out for a number of other reasons. He was predictably bright and precocious, even by the standards of an honors program. Yet he was so exceedingly confident and poised. In the jargon of my profession, he appeared older than his stated age. This was not just because of the way he looked, but the way he acted. Dr. Kotler, he said one day, addressing me formally even though I preferred the use of my first name. What exactly is the reason for requiring that our papers describe interviews the way you suggest? Excuse me? I wasn't sure what he was driving at. I mean, if your intent is to get us to reflect on what we learned during this field study, wouldn't it make sense for us to use direct quotes rather than just descriptions of what people said? I heard a few classmates snicker. Was he challenging me? Your point is well taken, I said finally. I'm looking for a balance between what you observed and the sense you make of those experiences. As he nodded, I saw looks of admiration from his classmates. Everyone else had been so timid about speaking up, but Jason jumped in, treating me as a colleague. My first impression was that he might be a difficult student. Indeed, his eager-to-please attitude towards me, in combative, competitive tone with peers, did create a certain degree of turbulence. Yet, in spite of these challenges, I found Jason to be unusually smart, inquisitive, ambitious, and outspoken, and not afraid to advance opinions that might be unusual or unpopular. 
His style, though provocative and at times trying, actually proved a catalyst for drawing out other students who were quite timid. The semester-long seminar progressed nicely, perhaps one of my favorites in terms of depth and breadth of issues explored. The only thing that bothered me was the extent to which this group of students was concerned, made that obsessed with achievement. So many of their questions revolved around how various actions would affect their final grades. In a class of hard chargers, Jason stood out as especially intense. He found reasons to approach me after many classes, wanting very specific directions about future assignments. While at first I was annoyed by these overtures, which seemed transparently driven towards getting an A, I soon recognized that Jason was reaching out for help. It became our pattern to escort one another to our next classes. During these strolls across campus, Jason confided in me about his plans for the future, conflicts with his family, and the relationship with his girlfriend. In everything he talked about, and everything he did, he struck me as incredibly driven. I urged him to lighten up a bit, to stop trying so hard to do everything perfectly. Perhaps I recognized more than a little of myself in him. I too was an avid approval seeker, who found it difficult to slow down. I noticed that in spite of all that Jason had accomplished thus far in life, as an athlete, a scholar, and a personality on campus, he didn't seem to be having much fun. Actually, he seemed haunted. He was a straight-A student, chief justice of the student government, president of the Psychology Honors Society, and a leader in community civic organizations. As we walked around campus, students, faculty, even administrators whom I barely knew by sight, seemed familiar with him. At times he would press me for advice about personal matters, and each time I deftly put the focus back on him, as a counseling professor can easily do. I'll admit to feeling flattered he was willing to trust me. I could tell it was difficult for him to open up. As the semester wound down, Jason and I got together for our last meeting. He thanked me for a stimulating class, then caught me by surprise by abruptly changing the subject. Shyly, he invited me to attend his honors thesis presentation. I reluctantly agreed. These presentations, which were usually about some obscure area of research I could barely follow, could be quite boring. In fact, I couldn't help grimacing as I reflected on the last one I attended, dealing with political corruption in East Africa. It might have been interesting if there hadn't been so much sparring among the faculty committee members, each of whom was eager to demonstrate his expertise. As the day for the event approached, I felt a little better about going. I didn't really have the time, but it was a constructive ritual, and I felt honored that Jason thought enough of me to extend an invitation. Usually, there were only a handful of people in attendance, three faculty members on the students' committee, and perhaps a friend or a parent. I was shocked, therefore, when I walked into the room, make that the auditorium, and found seventy or eighty people. Somehow, word had gotten out that something unusual was going to happen. I had no idea that the next few hours would hold me spellbound, propelling me through emotions that ranged from indignation to admiration. Jason stood before the audience in his new suit, anxiously pacing as he waited for the signal to begin. I could hear the crowd buzzing with anticipation, although I couldn't quite make out what they were saying. Can you believe it? Jason, gotta be a little. I sure wouldn't. So was she starting. In this presentation, Jason began nervously, I will be talking about accessing the minds of various serial killers from the perspective of their victims. You could hear a collective gasp from the audience, then complete silence, as if they were all holding their breath to see what would come next. Although much is known about the patterns of their behavior, Jason continued, even the nature of their childhoods, their motives, and fantasies, we really know very little about how they manage to overpower people, manipulate and degrade them, get them to do things they wouldn't otherwise consider. And then he went on to relate how, while only a freshman in college, he'd figure out a way to lure half a dozen of the most notorious serial killers into communication with him, eventually forging full-blown relationships with several. In each case, he researched meticulously what would interest them the most and then cast himself in the role of the disciple, admirer, businessman, surrogate, or potential victim. In a few instances, he actually interviewed the killers in prison, winning their trust and uncovering their secrets. Perhaps even more remarkable, 
In one case, he was able to experience firsthand what it's like to be stalked, seduced, manipulated, and eventually trapped by a deranged murderer who'd killed more than 30 times previously. If Jason's overview wasn't chilling enough, it was downright eerie to hear recordings of the killer's voices and see samples of their perverted writing. As I watched and listened to what Jason had done, I was flooded with questions. While everyone else in the room seemed captivated by the tales of perversion and mayhem committed by killers Jason had contacted, I was curious about what would motivate an 18-year-old to undertake a project like this, one that would not only jeopardize his sanity, but his physical safety. Little did I realize at the time I'd be the one entrusted with the task of helping Jason tell his story. When I met with him a few days later, he wanted to know if I'd be interested in collaborating with him on a book, analyzing the motives and behavior of his most ardent correspondent, John Wayne Gacy. In Illinois, during the 1970s, Gacy kidnapped, tortured, raped, and killed at least 33 young boys and buried many of them in his basement. Jason, I addressed him solemnly. I'm really flattered that you'd ask for my help with this. He looked away from me, preparing himself for what he anticipated would be rejection. I really am intrigued with what you've done, I reassured him. It's just you don't understand, he interrupted. Nobody really understands. I put my hand on his shoulder to stop what I could see was the beginning of an argument. It's not a good idea to get Jason started, unless you're prepared for a very long discussion, and I had other students waiting. You must understand me, I told him. Please, just listen. Let me finish. He nodded his head, but I could see his impatience. By now he'd grown used to people not getting his peculiar area of fascination. I decided to be blunt. Jason, nobody really cares about Gacy anymore. The guy died, what, four years ago? There's another one to take his place. Somebody new the public wants to know about. Yeah, he jumped in again. But Gacy was special. There's been nobody like him. And besides, this book wouldn't just be about Gacy. Remember, I also communicated with Charles Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Richard Ramirez, and I realized that, Jason. I quickly interjected. It's just that books have been written about Gacy. And these other guys before, and... So? He interrupted. What are you saying? That I shouldn't do this? That all this work I put into, no, quite the contrary. What I'm saying is that the book shouldn't be exclusively about these serial killers, but also about you. People would want to know why an 18-year-old kid contacted Gacy and the others in the first place. They'd be curious what would drive someone so young to want to study and control them. You have to admit, that's not the usual hobby for someone just out of high school. I laughed as I said this, until I noticed Jason's pained expression. He was used to being seen as a bit different from others his age. In order to understand your motives and what drives you, I continued, we'd have to start from the beginning. I already did that in the thesis. I started with the first letter I wrote to Gacy. No, I mean from the very beginning. People will want to know about your family and background how you got into this sort of stuff, how you managed to convince your parents to let you do this, how you hid other things from them. In some ways, this story is too incredible to believe. We'd have to lay the foundation. Indeed, the first thing I did was corroborate everything I could related to Jason's thesis. I conducted interviews with Jason's parents, separately and together, comparing their versions of the same events. I talked with his brother and friends, I spoke with other faculty who knew Jason. I looked through the hundreds of letters he received from various killers, following them sequentially. I listened to tapes of conversations he had with Gacy. At one point, I even traveled with him on one of his research excursions to death row. Once I was able to confirm and document the details of Jason's story, I investigated the context of what occurred. Slowly, a more complete picture of this young man began to take shape. He was obviously a precocious, talented kid, mature beyond his years. His parents, both working class and down-to-earth, 
had no idea what to do with a son who constantly challenged and mystified them. Since they couldn't seem to control their child's behavior, and since he had never, ever gotten in trouble, or in an academic setting, performed in less than exemplary fashion, they found it easy to give in to him. When they did try to rein him in, he still found ways around them. Although blessed with high intelligence and formidable verbal and athletic skills, Jason was vulnerable and insecure. He received a number of paradoxical messages growing up. At the same time that he was insulated from graphic violence and forbidden to see horror films, his mother was a true crime aficionado who left lurid books lying around the house. He found his parents' behavior volatile and unpredictable. He learned to be a chameleon as a way to protect himself, changing forms according to others' moods. He honed his talent for pleasing others to a fine art, reading perceptively what others most desire, and then presenting himself in ways designed to win trust. A natural mimic and fearless risk-taker, Jason studied psychology systematically, hoping to land a job someday as a famous prosecutor or FBI agent. Nobody who knew him scoffed at what he might be capable of accomplishing. This kid was going places. Certainly, nobody had more determination and ambition. The one discordant note was that his very existence depended so much on being seen as special and unique. In the story that follows, written in Jason's own words with my assistance, you'll meet Jason as he first stumbles onto his project's central feature that it might be possible for a teenager like himself to pull off what law enforcement and psychiatric experts have tried and largely failed to do, learn the homicidal tactics and secret fantasies of men who've killed twenty, thirty, even hundreds of times in the most grisly fashion imaginable. You'll learn about the early childhood experiences that propelled Jason toward his bizarre hobby. You'll see the reasons for his exaggerated self-importance, Understand why cockiness occasionally creeps into his voice as he talks about his triumphs over these celebrity killers. Jason wanted so badly to be recognized and validated. He wanted to feel powerful. And what better way to do that than to deceive and control the world's most famous human predators? Jason's personal motives aside, I believe that this story is unique in the annals of true crime literature. By peering over Jason's shoulder, we're able to catch a glimpse at the point of transaction, the exact moment when a serial killer makes contact with his victim and begins to reel him in. We're able to witness, through Jason's senses, exactly what it looks like and sounds like, what it feels like, to be manipulated, controlled, and dominated by a serial killer. Yet this narrative is not just one precocious kid's tale of a bizarre dance with the devil, or rather, several devils. In a broader sense, it's a portrait of the choreographed interactions between killers and victims everywhere. It describes, in excruciating detail, exactly how someone, even a person who is unusually vigilant, cautious, and intentional, can be drawn into the web of a killer who essentially makes a living stalking others. Looked at one way, this is an adventure story in which David attempts to take on a whole herd of Goliaths. Yet it is also immensely disturbing narrative, sexually explicit, perverse, and filled with brutality. It requires a strong stomach. One can't help but ask what would lead a person, especially someone so young, to enter this world willingly? Why would a first-year college student spend his time researching ways to ingratiate himself with murderers? Why would he risk using himself as bait? The truth is that many of us are fascinated with murder, killing, and violence. The whole genre of true crime books testifies to that, as does the popularity of films and novels in which graphic murder plays a central role. Jason's actions are thus emblematic of a culture in which violence is entertainment and murderers have become celebrities. Every new killer on the scene attracts his own share of groupies, fans, or spectators who can't get enough details about the grisly crimes. Web pages are devoted exclusively to following the exploits of famous killers, analyzing the grisly details of their crimes. Ironically, the biggest challenge Jason faced when he embarked on this project was how to capture the interest of someone like Charles Manson or John Wayne Gacy, given that they enjoyed the attention of thousands of fans who wrote weekly, sending them gifts and vying for their attention. Before committing to this project, I first had to wrestle with certain ethical issues. 
as a therapist and trainer of other therapists, among the most important values to me are authenticity and honesty, being completely open and straight with people. But here is a story in which a person resorts to deceit and manipulation to learn information that can't be gained any other way. While I was impressed by all the things Jason learned, his modus operandi seemed fraught with moral conundrums. In the end, I believe this was an important story to tell, not only because of what it uncovers about homicidal relationships, but also what it reveals about our culture that so glorifies violence and turns killers into celebrities. If Jason's experiences tell us anything, it is that pretending affinity with perpetrators of evil will, over time, wreck dire consequences on the psyche. When Jason embarked on his quest, he was too young to realize what a professional might have told him, that having stepped into the devil's lair, it's sometimes impossible to leave the nightmares behind. In a very real sense, Jason Moss was, for John Wayne Gacy, Richard Ramirez, Henry Lee Lucas, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Charles Manson, their last victim. There's a little strip mall in an older residential area in Las Vegas, far from the chaos of the other, more famous strip. From the university, it's a straight shot down Flamingo Road, a major artery of the city named after Bugsy Siegel's original resort. Typical of such malls, the row of shops contain an insurance agency, a hobby shop, an army recruiting office, a tuxedo rental outlet, a beauty shop, a used bookstore, and the obligatory Chinese restaurant with a $4.75 lunch special. There's also a kickboxing studio, which is why on this particular day in August 1993, I happened to be there. I was early for my appointment with my karate instructor, and he needed a place to escape the heat. Assessing my options, the bookstore seemed especially inviting, cool and quiet inside, and with plenty to occupy my attention. I was already feeling a bit stressed from my first week as a university student, so I welcomed a few minutes to literally chill out. As I began strolling the aisles, I noticed that I was one of the store's few customers. Even so, I was invisible to the board cashier, who was alternately thumbing through a book and taking inventory of others laying on the counter. In fact, there were books everywhere, some still resting in boxes, others neatly organized on the shelves. It was as if the owner couldn't quite figure out how to make inflow and outflow mesh. Because true crime had been an interest of mine since my early teens, I found myself in the store's crime section, staring at titles that somehow seemed familiar. Killer cults, FBI killer, Evil Harvest, Brother in Blood. I couldn't help noticing that, more often than not, blood was the most common denominator. Blood echoes, blood games, blood lust, blood sister, blood warning. Whoever came up with these titles seemed to have a thing for blood. Like many people, I was secretly, and a bit guiltily, fascinated by such material. It can be exciting to peek through your fingers at something forbidden and terrible. Just ask the millions of rubbernecks who slow down at accident scenes, hoping to catch a glimpse of a body. Among the hundreds of books that screamed with promises of blood and pain, one in particular caught my interest. Hunting Humans. A big, thick, encyclopedic volume. It presented profiles of some of the world's most famous serial killers. As I stood in the narrow aisle, turning pages, I began reflecting on how well camouflaged these predators are prior to being caught. They look like anybody else, living apparently normal lives, often appear charming, sociable, productive. But at the same time, they stalk and kill people, sometimes torturing and mutilating them. I wondered what it must be like to look in the mirror and realize you are the boogeyman. How are these people able to live with themselves? I was jolted out of my reverie by the sound of voices coming from across the aisle. Do you have a store credit? I could hear the cashier ask someone. I didn't catch the answer because in my mind, an idea was beginning to form. It was something on the edge of my consciousness, something I couldn't grab onto. The title of another book captured my attention. The Killer Clown. Now that's interesting, I thought, reaching for it. I'd always been afraid of clowns. As a child, my most frequent nightmare took place at my grandparents' house. In the dream, I was supposed to be taking a bath, but a strange sound drew me out of the tub to investigate. 
I started walking toward the stairs when I heard a scream, followed by a liquidy cackle. Looking down the stairs, I saw my grandmother sprawled out on the floor, blood slowly dripping from her mouth. Somewhere close, I heard an eerie laughter. I turned in the direction of the voice and was startled to see a clown sitting on the stairwell's balcony, laughing at me. I particularly remember the big red smile on his face. At that point, I'd always wake up. My parents and grandparents tell me that, as a kid, whenever I'd see a clown, I'd start crying in fear. Even today, there's something about that painted-on happy face, an exaggerated show of good cheer that I don't trust. There's something about the masks that clowns wear. I can't help feeling that the intention is to deceive. Call me paranoid, but I find myself wondering, who's the real person hiding behind that makeup? The idea that a killer would dress himself up as a clown to entertain sick children by day and then stalk the streets for prey at night seemed inconceivable to me. Yet I could identify with people who led double lives. How many times had I exuded confidence when taking an exam or engaged in a debate when, in fact, I was less than sure of myself? I decided to buy both books, the one about hunting humans and the other about the killer clown, even though it would put a crimp in my student budget. At that time, I had no idea the true cost would ultimately be much higher. On the drive home from the kickboxing session, I glanced over at the passenger seat and saw my new purchases lying on top of my book pack. Clearly, I was enthralled by these types of books, and yet I felt very ambivalent about it since true crime is also an interest of my mother's. We fought a lot, my mother and I, usually about her wanting to control my life in some way. I tried to distance myself from her as much as I could, and it really bothered me that we now share this interest. My mother couldn't get enough of slasher books. Ever since I was little, I'd seen her hunched over them, shaking her head at their grisly contents. As far back as I could remember, our kitchen table was stacked with books featuring lurid covers and even more graphic photo sections. Usually, the books were obtained from the public library, a regular destination for my mother and me. I'd get lost in the long, endless aisles while she searched for titles that interested her. Eventually, we'd both end up in the back reading room, which had been designed for toddlers to comb through picture books. I have vivid memories of walls decorated with large pictures of rainbows and oversized happy-faced sons. In the very back of the room, there was a table close to the wall. Even after I was older, but before I reached the age where going to the library with your mom was no longer considered cool, the two of us would sit at the table and talk about our selections. On one particular day, I was 13 at the time, she plunked her books on the table and exclaimed, Jason, you won't believe this one. She pulled a volume from the middle of her pile and with I've got a secret grin on her face, began leafing through the pages. What's it about? I asked apprehensively. I knew what was coming next. You'll never believe it. Wait until you hear what this one guy did. It's so disgusting. So why are you telling me about it? I wondered. Still, I knew better than to challenge her. The library was about to close, so only about half the lights were still on. The muted light lent the room a spooky atmosphere that made me feel even more on edge. Uh, Mom, let's get out of here. No, no, not yet, she said. I want to show you this. Come on, I said, rolling my eyes. This will just take a few minutes. There's this guy who would take the skin off women he'd killed and save it. He was trying to make a suit of real human flesh. He wanted to be a woman. Why couldn't my mother read cookbooks or something? I tried to interrupt as she was on a roll. He kept a whole box of women's vaginas, she said. He made a belt of human nipples. He had lampshades made of human flesh. Now, although it was certainly my life's ambition to see a real-life vagina, to date I'd never had the pleasure of viewing, I had a great difficulty imagining a whole box of them. And what on earth did someone do with a belt made of nipples? That's great, Mom, but I really think we need to leave. They're closing the place soon. Look. The lights are going out. Wait, just a minute. You have to see this. She opened the book to some glossy pictures. Isn't it gross? She asked me. The police found it when they entered the killer's house. My mother pointed to a photo of a female corpse, hanging upside down from a wooden beam. The woman had been decapitated, and her body was sliced down the middle from her throat all the way to her vagina. 
all of her major organs had been removed. Jason, you really should read this book. But you already told me all the good parts, I deadpanned. She couldn't tell if I was kidding or not. Do you want me to check this book out or not? No, I said adamantly. I don't want to even hear about this sick stuff. And I'm going to tell Dad about all this crap you're reading. My mother started looking around, embarrassed by my outburst. We both realized it was time to get out of there. I was so angry I could barely talk. As usual, my mother had no idea what I was so upset about. Although that day my mother's enthusiasm had rubbed me the wrong way, eventually I did become intrigued with the books she was reading. Over the next year, she continued to tell me about crime stories she'd heard or read about, and pretty soon I was reading them too, reading them voraciously. I was amazed by the power these killers wielded, not just their physical power in some cases, but their power to stun a nation. I was intrigued by how they could terrify even the most unflappable and cause armies of law enforcement officials to scramble madly in search of them. Even as these predators disgusted me, I envied the public attention they commanded. Too, against my better impulses, I found myself admiring the artful way many of them stalked their prey and eluded detection. Eventually, as kind of a self-dare, one intended to relieve teenage tedium more than anything, I began pretending to be the person I was reading about. I know that sounds weird, but I really wanted to figure out why and how these people could do what they do. I imagined what it would be like to stalk and kill. I put aside all I'd been taught about right and wrong. I tried to pretend I was someone without a conscience. I tried to get to that level of consciousness where one exults in being truly evil. It was terrifying to be in that dark, remote place. A place where sanity is experienced as something outside. I'm not sure I ever fully got there. I am, after all, a sane person. A moral person. But the attempt to reach the other side was exhilarating. As I shifted in the car seat to work out the stiffness from my kickboxing session, I spied my driveway up ahead. The suburban house we lived in was, for that area, pretty much standard issue. Red tile roof, white stucco walls. It had been a comfortable place to grow up in, and as I was already coming to learn, it would be a welcome refuge from the pressures of university life. As I turned off the engine, I once again glanced at my new books. What sort of house had the killer clown grown up in? I wondered. Was it a place from which sanity had fled? A dark place? Or a place much like mine? Our house had the lived-in look you'd expect, knowing that two teenage boys were in residence. There was enough room for my mother, father, 14-year-old brother, and me to each have our own space. But increasingly I felt closed in, and I resented more and more the constant monitoring of my activities. Lately, it seemed like whatever I did drew criticism, especially from my mother. Jason! I could hear her yell from out in the garage, just as I settled in with one of my books. I'm back with the groceries. Get out here and help me. Just a minute, I grunted, frustrated that she was obviously in one of her moods. It never seemed to take much of us to end up in a fight, but lately we were butting heads all the time. When the two of us went at it, my brother and father gave us wide berth. We all loved each other, and most of the time, supported one another, but I seemed to end up in the middle of any disagreement. My father was a really nice guy, kind and always supportive, but he deferred to my mom a lot, letting her make most of the decisions. Whether by choice or circumstance, she became the disciplinarian, the one who made sure my brother and I did our schoolwork and took care of our chores. She also threw up roadblocks whenever I wanted to do something that deviated from the straight and narrow. I'm a fighter myself, unwilling to give in without a battle, so we were constantly going at each other while my brother and father stood on the sidelines. It's a legend in our family, and maybe it's true, that my mom and I continually get in each other's way because we're so alike. That theory seemed borne out this particular afternoon when she found me reading at the kitchen counter. Jason she said in exasperation, walking into the house with an armload of grocery bags. I am not carrying in all these bags by myself. Didn't you hear me? Sorry, Mom. I meant to say contritely, but it came out sarcastic. I was doing something important. Do you expect me to drop everything and come running every time you come home? Yes, 
make sure you put the milk in the fridge. While I was busy unloading the car, my mother discovered what I had been up to. Hey, you've got some pretty great books here. When can I read them? You can't, I told her, reaching up to put a can on the shelf. I'm reading them now. Besides, you shouldn't read this kind of stuff. You can't handle it. To punctuate the last remark, I slammed the cupboard door. You're the one who can't handle blood, she teased. I hope you don't pass out while you're reading. My mother loved to make fun of me because I had a weak stomach for any sort of blood or gore. Some of the favorite stories in my family were of me fainting. Ignoring her, I went back to my book about the killer clown, John Wayne Gacy. Isn't that about the guy who tortured and killed all those boys and then buried them under the house? My mother asked, noticing the cover. Yeah, I answered, hoping she'd go away. Then you'd better leave it alone. You've always been afraid of clowns. Leave it to my mother to get in the last word. Even she couldn't get to me that day, though. I was fascinated by Gacy's story. It was such a strange tale. Here was this guy making 300000 a year in 1970 yet. He's got this successful business, he's head of the JCs, and volunteers his time to help sick kids. The book even had a picture of him standing next to Rosalind Carter, wife of the president. Incredible. Meanwhile, he's torturing his victims for hours, even days at a time. I read about one unlucky guy, about my age, who was picked up at a bus station while he was waiting for his scheduled departure. Gacy brought the guy home and then raped him, repeatedly, before he began torturing him, playing Russian roulette with a loaded pistol, and then submerging his face in a bathtub full of water to a point where he passed out. Then he violated the kid again with various objects around the house, all the while screaming at him that he was going to die. The more I read, the queasier I started to feel, and yet I couldn't put the book down. Gacy's victims were the same age I was. They even resembled me physically. I couldn't help but wonder what I would have done if he tried to capture me. I may have been a weightlifter and a kickboxer, but it was clear that each of these strong, athletic guys Gacy preyed upon was somehow tricked into submission. I thought to myself, I'd just love to see Gacy try that stuff on me. Well, maybe not. It was at that moment that the vague idea that had tugged at the edge of my consciousness in the bookstore began to clarify itself. I wondered what would happen if I wrote Gacy a letter. I read that he was still on death row, waiting for his scheduled execution. I figured he was probably pretty bored and in need of diversion. For me, the question wasn't why I'd write someone like Gacy, but why anyone wouldn't be curious about what made him the way he was. Was the act of killing for the 33rd time any different from the 17th? How could this guy excel at maintaining two separate lives, community leader by day, murderous predator by night? It seemed to me that these were the questions anyone would want answered. The more I read about serial killers, the more convinced I became that the so-called experts, the police and forensic psychologists, weren't exploring all possible avenues of inquiry. Surely what was needed was more than having captured killers fill out questionnaires and submit to interviews. I wondered what kind of effort had been made to debrief the victims, those who'd lived to tell the tale. In a burst of inspiration, I considered what I might learn if I approached someone like Gacy in the guise of one of his victims. Of course, most kids my age, or adults for that matter, would never even think about taking on a project like this. But I'd done some pretty crazy things in the past. And to tell you the truth, I needed to divert myself with something that wasn't school-related. After going to college for a week, I could tell that, in many ways, it was going to be an extension of high school. I was living at home, and I desperately wanted some excitement in my life. Furthermore, I hoped for a job in law enforcement someday, maybe even one with the FBI. For that dream to happen, I knew I had to distinguish myself in some way. If gaining the trust of a serial killer didn't get the Bureau's attention, what would?